can I ask you about substances, chemical substances that affect the video game, the dream world. So psychedelics that increasingly have been uh, getting a lot of research done on them. So in general, psychedelics, uh, psilocybin, MDMA, but also a really interesting one, the big one, which is DMT. What and where are the places that these substances take the mind that is operating in the dream world? Do you have an interesting sense how this throws a wrinkle into the prediction model? Is it just some weird little quirk or is there is there some fundamental expansion of the mind going on? I suspect that a way to look at psychedelics is that they induce particular types of lucid dreaming states. So it's a state in which uh, certain connections are being s severed in your mind, they're no longer active, mm -hmm. where your mind basically gets free to move in a certain direction because some inhibition, some particular inhibition doesn't work anymore. And as a result, you might stop having a self or you uh, might uh, stop perceiving the world as uh, three-dimensional. And you can explore that state. And I suppose that for every state that can be induced with psychedelics, there are people that are naturally in that state. Mm -hmm. So uh, sometimes psychedelics that shift you through a range of possible mental states, and they can also shift you out of the range of permissible mental states, that is where you can make predictive models of reality. And what I observe in people that use psychedelics uh, a lot is that they tend to be overfitting. Overfitting means that you are um, you, uh, using more bits for modeling the dynamics of a function than you should. And so you can uh, fit your curve to extremely detailed things in the past, but this model is no longer predictive for the future. W what is it about psychedelics that forces that? I thought it would be the opposite. I, th I thought uh, that it's a, it's a good mechanism for, uh, uh, for generalization, for regularization. So it, it, it feels like psychedelics expansion of the mind, like taking you outside of, like forcing your model to be uh, non-predictive is a good thing. Meaning like, uh, it's, it's almost like, okay, what I would uh, say psychedelics are akin to is traveling to a totally different environment. Like going, if you've never been to like India or something like that from the United States, very different set of people, different culture, different food, different roads and, values and all those kinds of things. Yeah, so psychedelics can, for instance, um, teleport people into a universe that is uh, hyperbolic, which means that yeah. uh, if you imagine a room that you're in, you can uh, turn around 360 degrees and you didn't go full circle. You need to go 720 degrees to yeah, go full circle. Exactly. So uh, the things that people learn in that state cannot be easily transferred in this universe that we are in. It could be that uh, if they're able to abstract and understand what happened to them, that they understand that uh, some part of their spatial cognition has been desynchronized and has found a different synchronization. And this different synchronization happens to be a hyperbolic one, right? Mm -hmm. So you learn something interesting about your brain. It's difficult yeah. to understand what exactly happened, but we get a pretty good idea once we understand how the brain is representing geometry. Yeah, but doesn't give you a, a fresh perspective on the physical reality? Who's making that sound? Is it inside my head or is it external? Well, there is no sound outside of your mind, but uh, <laughs> it's making sense <laughs> of phenomena in physics. <laughs> uh, yeah, in the physical reality, there's uh, there's sound waves <sighs> traveling through air. Okay. That's our model of what happened. That's our model of what happened, right. Uh, so, that, that doesn't uh, don't psychedelics give you a fresh perspective on this physical reality, like on, on not this physical reality, but this this more um, what what do you call the dream world? That's so ma the, mapped directly the to the purpose it. of dreaming at night. I think is yeah so data augmentation. Well, the, oh, exactly. So that's, so you that's basically, very different. That's uh, very similar to psychedelics. Change right? parameters uh, mm -hmm. about the things that you have learned. And uh, for instance, when you are young, you have seen things from certain perspectives, but not from others. Yeah. So your brain is generating new perspectives of objects that you already know 
which means they can learn to recognize them later from different perspectives. And I suspect that's the reason why many of us remember to have flying dreams as children, because it's just different perspectives of the world that we already know, and that it uh, it starts to generate these pers uh, different perspective changes, and then it fluidly turns this into a flying dream to make sense of what's happening, mm -hmm. right? So you fill in the gaps, and suddenly you see yourself flying. Mm -hmm. And uh, similar things can happen with semantic relationships. So it's not just spatial relationships, but it can also be the uh, relationships between ideas that are being changed. And it seems that the mechanisms that make that happen during dreaming um, are interacting with these uh, same receptors that are being simulated by psychedelics. Mm -hmm. So uh, I suspect that there is a thing that I haven't read really about the way in which dreams are induced in the brain is not just that the um, activity of the brain gets tuned down because you are somehow uh, your eyes are closed and you no longer get enough data from your uh, eyes, but there is a particular type of neurotransmitter that is saturating your brain during these uh, phases, during the RM phases, and you produce uh, controlled hallucinations. Mm -hmm. And psychedelics are linking into these mechanisms, I suspect. So, so isn't that an another trickier form of data augmentation? Yes, but uh, it's also data augmentation that can happen outside of the specification that your brain is tuned to. So basically people are overclocking their brains and that uh, that produces states that are subjectively extremely interesting. Yeah, I just... But I'm, from uh, the outside, very suspicious. So <laughs> I, I think I'm over applying the metaphor of a neural network in my own mind, uh, which... I just think that doesn't lead to overfitting, right? But uh, uh, but you were just sort of anecdotally saying my experiences with people that have done psychedelics or that, that, that kind of quality. I think it typically that happens. So if you look at people like uh, Timothy Leary, and he has written beautiful manifestos about uh, the effect of LSD on people, he genuinely believed, he writes in these manifestos, that in the future, science and art will only be done on psychedelics because it's so much more efficient and so much better. And he gave uh, LSD to children in his community of a few yeah. thousand people that he had near San Francisco. And uh, basically, he was losing touch with reality. He did not understand the effects that the things that he was doing would have on the reception of psychedelics by society, because he was unable to think critically about what happened. What happened was that he got in, in a euphoric state. Mm -hmm. That euphoric state happened because he was overfitting. He was taking this sense of euphoria and translating it into a, a model of actual success in the world. Right? He was feeling better. Mil limitations had disappeared that he exper uh, experienced to be existing, okay. but he didn't get superpowers. I understand what you mean by overfitting now. Uh, I, I mean, there's a, a lot of interpretation to the term overfitting in this case, but I, I, I got you. So he was getting he was getting uh, positive rewards from a lot of actions that he yeah, shouldn't have Yeah, but not just this. So if you take, for instance, John Lilly, who um, was studying dolphin languages and uh, aliens and so on, yeah. uh, a lot of people that use psychedelics became very loopy. Mm. And uh, the typical thing that you notice when people are on psychedelics is that they are in a state where they feel that everything can be explained now. Everything is clear. Everything is obvious. Yeah. And uh, sometimes they have indeed discovered a useful connection, but not always. Very often these connections are over interpretations. I wonder, you know, there's a question of uh, correlation versus causation. And also I wonder if it's the psychedelics or if it's more the social, like being the outsider uh, and having a strong community of, of outside and being having a leadership position in an outsider cult-like community that could have a much stronger effect of overfitting than do psychedelics themselves, the actual substances, because it's a counterculture thing. So it could be that as opposed to the actual substance. If you're a boring person who wears a suit and tie and works at a bank uh, and takes psychedelics, that could be a very different effect of psychedelics on, uh, on your mind. It, I'm just sort of raising the point that the people you referenced are already weirdos. I'm not sure exactly. Oh, no, not necessarily. A lot of the people that uh, tell me that they use psychedelics uh, in a useful way uh, started out as squares and uh, were liberating themselves because they were stuck. They were basically stuck in local optimum of their own self-model, of their relationship to the world, and suddenly they had data augmentation. They basically saw a, a, an experience, a space of possibilities. They experienced what it would be like to be another person. Yeah. And they took 
uh, important lessons from that experience back home? Yeah, I mean, uh, I love the, the the metaphor of data augmentation because that's uh, been the the primary driver of self supervised learning in the vision computer vision domain is data augmentation. So it's funny to think of data augment like like chemically induced data augmentation in the human mind. There's also a very interesting effect that I uh, uh, noticed. I I know uh, several people who are swear to me that uh, LSD has cured their migraines. So mm. severe cluster headaches or migraines that uh, didn't respond to standard medication that disappeared after a single dose. And I don't recommend anybody doing this, especially not in the US where it's illegal. Uh, and there are no studies on this for that reason. But uh, it seems that uh, anecdotally that it basically uh, can reset the serotonergic system. So it's basically... Um, pushing them outside of their normal boundaries. And as a result, it needs to find a new e equilibrium. And in some people, that equilibrium is better. Mm. But it also follows that in other people, it might be worse. So if you have a brain that is already teetering on uh, the boundary to psychosis, uh, it can be permanently pushed over that boundary. Well, that's why you have to do good science, which they're starting to do on all these different substances of how well it actually works for the different conditions, like MDMA seems to help with PTSD. Uh, same with psilocybin, that, you know, you, you need to do good science, meaning large studies of large N. Yeah, so based on the existing studies uh, with MDMA, it seems that um, if you look at Rick Doblin's work and what he has published about this and talks about, uh, MDMA seems to be a psychologically relatively safe drug, but it's physiologically not very safe. That is, uh, there is uh, neurotoxicity if you would use a too large dose and if you Uh, combine this with alcohol, which a lot of kids do in uh, party settings during raves and so on. It's uh, very hepat hepatotoxic, so basically you can kill your liver. And uh, this means that it's probably something that is best and most productively used in a clinical setting mm -hmm. by people who really know what they're doing. And I suspect that's also true for the other psychedelics. That is, uh, while the other psychedelics are probably not as toxic uh, as, say, alcohol, Uh, the effects on the psyche can be much more profound and lasting. Yeah. Uh, well, as far as I know, psilocybin, so mushrooms, magic mushrooms, uh, as far as I know, in terms of the studies they're running, I think have no over, like they're allowed to do what they're calling heroic doses. So that one does not have a toxicity. So they could do like huge doses in a clinical setting when they're doing study on psilocybin, which is kind of fun. <laughs> yeah. It seems that most of the psychedelics work in extremely small doses. Uh, yeah. which means that uh, the effect on the rest of the body is relatively low. And yeah. uh, MDMA is probably the exception. Maybe ketamine can be dangerous in larger doses because it can uh, depress breathing and so on. But um, the uh, LSD and psilocybin work in very, very small doses, at least the active part of them, of um, psilocybin LSD is only the active part. And the But the effect that you, it can have on your mental wiring can be very dangerous, I think.